So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today. We have a very interesting program. Um, and uh, yeah, the next one hour will be full of different presentations. Uh, so welcome to the Jew Indigenous Alliance session on strengthening inclusive partnerships. My name is Nicolina Mileva, and uh, I'm a research assistant at the University of Augsburg. I'm uh, working on the effects of deforestation and reforestation on local and global climate. And I'm actually, uh, I'm also involved in uh, some uh, projects uh, led by indigenous people. Uh, for example, the Shakaim project, which is about reforestation uh, in, the, uh, in the Amazon forest. And um, yeah, so um, before we start with the actual presentations, there are some uh, housekeeping rules. So um, yeah, I would like to remind you, if you haven't done that yet, um, please change your name into organization followed by your full name. So we know who's uh, asking the questions. Um, also uh, mute your audio when you're not speaking so we can make sure that um, there, there is no uh, interference with the, with the presenter. For the Q&A session, uh, we will basically use the chat. So post all your questions in the chat. Uh, we have actually very little time to answer questions after the presentation themselves. Uh, but if your question doesn't get answered, then we will have at the end of the session a little bit more time for discussion. So then you answer, you get answer to your question um, a little bit later. Um, yeah, also keep in mind that um, some of the presenters um, would not be um, attending. Uh, actually, uh, we'll watch a couple of pre-recorded videos. And uh, if you have uh, questions for them, uh, then we'll make sure to, to forward the questions and then you'll get an uh, answer to your question um, a little bit later. Okay. Um, yeah, another thing, so uh, please be aware that uh, the meeting will be recorded. And yeah, I think uh, now we can uh, start with our first presenter, Crichton Brand. So Crichton is a senior advisor at Pew Science Australia for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander engagement. He's also the principal advisor of the Jew Indigenous Alliance, sharing knowledge so that First Nations people are heard and acknowledged as the Alliance engages with the broader scientific and spatial communities. So Crichton, over to you. Great, thank you very much everybody. And thank you for that introduction. Um, I welcome everybody to this meeting. Uh, I work in the lands of the Ngambri and Ngunnawal people, but today I'm speaking from the lands of the Palawa people in Tasmania. Um, today's meeting has an emphasis on Indigenous knowledge and climate action, women's empowerment, Indigenous youth, and Indigenous data sovereignty. Uh, I live in a country where our First Nations people have been observing nature continuously for over 40,000 years. They have observed and adapted through ongoing cycles and changes. And the amounts of knowledge of vegetation, landscapes, fire regimes, seasonality is championed often by the senior women in the communities. And now we see just how important these leaders are when they are guiding the indigenous youth, helping them to establish their place in a changing world. These people share insights and are respecting the cultural IP. And this will be key for our next steps. So I was uh, part of the, the initiation of the uh, Indigenous Alliance, and we have some very, uh, very talented people and very knowledgeable people. And it's, um, I'm actually uh, thrilled to be in, in a role there, uh, supporting them on their journey. So um, I'd again like to welcome everybody here to this meeting, and I look forward to how it uh, un unfolds. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Crichton, uh, for this great introduction. And um, yeah, let's um, not waste time, but uh, switch to our uh, first presenter. Uh, this is Titus Letapo. So uh, Titus is a leader from the Samburu tribe in Northern Kenya. He's also a co-founder of the Jew Indigenous Alliance and director of community programs at the Sarara Foundation. And uh, he will be speaking today about disasters re risk reduction and indigenous knowledge. Thank you very much and um, hello everyone. 
um, has been introduced. My name is Titus Letapo, and I work for uh, an indigenous-led uh, organization called uh, Sarara Foundation uh, that focuses on uh, supporting the Samburu uh, community um, in terms of uh, education, health, um, and again, uh, ensuring that uh, uh, maybe conservation work is done uh, to support the local, uh, the local people. Um, specifically, I will be talking about the role of uh, indigenous knowledge uh, for disaster risk reduction. Um, and um, just to mention, uh, as Samburu uh, community, which is an indigenous community in northern part of Kenya, we believe ourselves that uh, we, we are the environment. Uh, we are not basically not part of the environment, but fully we are the environment. Uh, that means that uh, uh, the environment is critical and very important, and we know it's God-given. Uh, and uh, as a community, we have a responsibility uh, to protect the environment, to ensure that uh, all that God has put in place uh, within it uh, is purely uh, taken care of. Um, again, uh, indigenous knowledge, knowledge is very important, uh, and it can be transferred and even adopted by other communities in similar situation. We know that uh, we have uh, so many or several indigenous communities across the world. And you'll find that uh, we might have similar challenges or even uh, similar disaster happening within, uh, within, our, within, uh, within maybe the, the, the globe. And I think uh, transferring such knowledge or maybe knowing what uh, the Samburu community uh, has done maybe to reduce uh, disaster or maybe to mitigate disaster can still be beneficial even to uh, people or indigenous people in Amazon or uh, other areas. Uh, similarly, um, uh, indigenous knowledge also encourages communities uh, to participate and even empower them uh, uh, in terms of disaster um, uh, and dealing and dealing with them. Um, and again, uh, it, this one also have a very valuable information that can ha help all of us uh, to deal uh, with the disaster as they come. Um, so, just to mention a few uh, key roles uh, indigenous knowledge. Uh, have in dealing with the disaster. Uh, one of it being um, um, communities, for the knowledge they have, they appreciate the fact that uh, um, they have a responsibility, as, as I said earlier, uh, as a community or as a, an indigenous uh, community to deal with their own, uh, or maybe to deal with their pro own problem uh, without necessarily uh, waiting for other, 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 other people to come and support. Uh, again, uh, um, the indigenous knowledge can be used uh, or can be uh, maybe enhanced uh, to create uh, development or technologies that can support efforts towards uh, disaster risk management. For example, uh, currently we are working with a small team to develop uh, an application uh, that can be used on a, either on a phone uh, using traditional knowledge uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, looking at the stars, looking at the uh, uh, wildlife behavior or animal, animal uh, livestock behavior, and you can easily uh, tell uh, what kind of disaster is coming uh, by just looking at uh, uh, the behavior of wildlife and even the the the, 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 the migratory di direction of let's say wildlife. So that one can be documented, and even an application or something like an application can be developed to assist the local communities that uh, come up. Uh, um, with strategies to deal with the, with the, with the uh, disaster as they come. Uh, secondly, um, it also enables the communities, uh, the, 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 the traditional knowledge enables the communities uh, develop their own strategies they, uh, uh, to help them reduce a, a disaster, um, uh, basically by uh, using their own traditional, uh, traditional knowledge. Um, the other thing is that uh, we have elders uh, who, are, who are the custodian of these uh, traditional knowledge. Uh, so they also still have a role to ensure that uh, the knowledge they have in terms of uh, dealing with, uh, with the disaster um, transferred to the younger generations um, to enable them maybe carry the knowledge uh, uh, towards, towards the future. Uh, so basically as a, as a Samburu community, we have a lot of uh, uh, ways of dealing with the disaster. Um, first of all, the first thing that currently we are doing in terms of our drought, we have a planned grazing, um, and this plant, this planned grazing has been there uh, for, for many years, 
where communities know that uh, this uh, this period of the year or this period of the month we are supposed to graze our livestock on uh, this maybe direction um again making sure that the water points are controlled um we don't just necessarily use the water points uh in Auli. we have a, the elders have a very strong plan um where the community has to follow to ensure that uh, if drought comes then they are able um, their livestock have enough pasture to take them through the through the period um we also have a traditional uh, bylaws or maybe traditional laws uh, that uh, sometimes if somebody breaks then uh, that one can be used to punish anybody who breaks the law so uh, that those bylaws are not written uh, they are within the people mind they know that uh, if elders say not to do one two three then uh, you have to strictly follow it so also as a, as a, as a community we have that uh, responsibility ensuring that uh, maybe the, the knowledge is transferred to uh, the local community. Uh, otherwise, um, thank you very much. I know time is uh, very limited. Uh, I welcome the questions later on. Yeah, thank you a lot. Um, I think we have like one minute for questions and um, I will just use the opportunity to ask one myself. Um, so you mentioned um, uh, that it's uh, very important um, to transfer the knowledge um, also across indigenous communities all over the world. So I just wanted to ask you, do you already have some experience sharing your knowledge with uh, other indigenous communities, um, basically somewhere else in the world? And um, if yes, uh, what are the obstacles or what are some positive, positive examples? Yeah, I, 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 yes, it, we, as a Samburu community, we have, we have been having uh, some exchange programs, especially for maybe pastoral communities uh, in Kenya, East Africa, and also some part of um, Africa, uh, where maybe communities visit, visit us uh, to come and learn on, uh, let's say, the traditional methods of uh, control grazing. Um, so they come and learn from us, and sometimes also uh, we support them uh, if requested. Uh, the obstacle, the huge obstacle is uh, in terms of funding or maybe making, enabling uh, communities to uh, learn from one another is also a very expensive exercise uh, because uh, people have to travel uh, from one point to another point. Uh, so that one's also a, a, a huge challenge. Uh, currently uh, with the COVID-19 COVID, uh, in place, uh, you'll find that also Restriction is very high. Uh, so at the moment, I don't think it's uh, possible. Uh, technology uh, is also not favoring the pastoral communities or people, the indigenous people in most of the part, uh, especially where we are. You'll find that our network, uh, let's say even uh, uh, signals or even uh, network uh, coverage is not uh, in all places. We have areas that have hard to reach areas. Yeah, so technology is also a challenge uh, uh, for us. Yeah, thank you a lot. And uh, I think it's time to uh, go to our next speaker. Uh, so our next speaker is Mario Vargas Chacan. Uh, Mario is an indigenous Shuar from the Ecuadorian Amazon. He's a founding member of the Jew Indigenous Alliance. And uh, he's also a member of the network of climate finance specialists as a representative of uh, South America. And uh, currently he works uh, as a coordinator of the indigenous organizations of the Amazon Basin as a technical coordinator. And uh, today he'll be speaking about the role of indigenous knowledge. So we have um, actually a pre-recorded uh, video uh, for Mario, but uh, he's here live so he can answer your questions later. Can you see the video? Uh, yes, we can. Is there sound? 
I think the audio is um, maybe uh, not switched on. We cannot hear the. Just one second. Sorry, please. Yes. Uh, sorry for this. Let me start again. Quiero expresar mis saludos desde la Amazonía ecuatoriana. Soy Mario Vargas. En esta ocasión yep, yep. quisiera exponer sobre nuestros conocimientos de los pueblos amazónicos que han servido para poder afrontar algunos cambios que hemos vivido en nuestra naturaleza, que estamos nosotros como pueblo afrontando día a día. Nuestros conocimientos han sido de vital importancia para proteger nuestra selva, nuestra madre naturaleza, en donde celosamente conservamos nuestros recursos, aquellos recursos que han servido para dar vida a muchos de nuestros pueblos que milenariamente estamos asentados en comunidades. Quisiera hacer hincapié a la comunidad científica para que los conocimientos de nuestros ancestros, de nuestros pueblos, sean tomado en cuenta, porque gracias a esos conocimientos nosotros hemos podido proteger, conservar nuestro bosque y también esos conocimientos han servido para poder proteger de cualquier interés gubernamental. Frente a nuestra realidad que hemos vivido como pueblos en esta pandemia, también ha servido esos conocimientos de nuestros antepasados, de nuestros abuelos, para poder proteger a nuestros seres queridos que en esta pandemia sufrieron y que gracias a nuestra madre naturaleza en donde están nuestras medicinas pudimos salvar muchas vidas por lo tanto invito a la comunidad científica que estos conocimientos de nuestros pueblos se han tomado en cuenta, se han respetado y que nuestras voces también sean consideradas parte científica para poder colaborar, para poder ser parte y contribuir con la madre naturaleza que en este momento está viviendo cambios muy radicales y está golpeando a muchos pueblos. Como podemos ver, hay épocas que hace mucha lluvia, muchos vientos, calor muy fuerte, esos cambios estamos viviendo en la actualidad. Por lo tanto, invito a que nuestros conocimientos sean respetados, sean tomados en cuenta. Muchas gracias. Moderator, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, excuse me. Um, so uh, basically, we have um, only uh, one minute for questions, and uh, I will again use the opportunity to ask one. Um, so actually, um, I'm involved myself in a, a project that is uh, led by Mario, the Shakine project. And uh, I'd love to use the opportunity um, to ask Mario to uh, tell us a few words about this project. And um, yeah, it will just uh, take a couple of times so my colleague Jana can uh, translate the question for Mario.
Okay, um, I guess uh, the translation will um, take a little bit longer, so um, maybe we can get answer to this question later during our uh, discussion. So I suggest we uh, go to our next speaker. So this is our next speaker is uh, Lilian Guracha. Lilian is from the Samburu tribe in Kenya, and she's the founder of Women Conserve. Um, this is a small grassroots community-based uh, organization, uh, which is empowering uh, women to be uh, great conservationists. Uh, she's a former gender specialist at the Northern Rangelands Trust, and she's currently studying at St. Paul's University. Um, so uh, we have a pre-recorded video from Lydian, but uh, she'll be here to answer your questions. So um, I'll ask Florian to play the video and then we'll have some time for, for questions. Can you see the video? Yes. Tana keji sekarnia aku nikea aku ntito. Tana keji lmenejenia aku nikea aku ntito. Tana aldaire kitaike aku ntito. Tutukipata na bakidogo, hakuna sauti. Wakilishaji na maanisha sauti. Representation means voice. Uki on, ukisema hii ni yangu. Mayene ambaye huko unasema ni yangu, lasima utachangia kwa njia yote ili. The, the title also matters, that it's my land, it's my conservation. Kitambo, akukua na hiyo ownership, akukua na hiyo involvement. Nikijo na na, ikijo na na hii, kwa sababu kwa ntoku na raia na na hii, na ninyo ntoku na yekita maendeleo kitok. Tene, epo ina itibiri bodi, yao kuna ngo jitin, enti wiki ndo mono katua. Tono po ineji, kia siri shoi, enti sara baki ndo mono. Kama kuna public barasa waende, wasi itwe, wao wenyewe wajue waende, sauti yao kisikika watatoka kwa shida Okay thank you for uh, this uh, video and uh, yeah I think it's um, really interesting and important to uh, emphasize the role of uh, women and um, as it was mentioned in the video if there is a job or a project just employ women too and um, if I may use the uh, opportunity to, to ask a, questions, uh, to, a question to Lillian, um, what have been your uh, biggest challenges in facing when uh, working on empowering women and involving more women in, in projects and jobs? So actually, I don't see Lillian amongst the participants, so it might be that currently she's having some connectivity issues, but um, it means that we can uh, move further with our program and then we'll have a couple of more minutes uh, during the discussion session to, uh, to ask questions. Okay, so uh, we can go to our um, next speaker, uh, which is uh, Galina Angarova. Galina is a representative of the Ekirit Nation of the Buryat people, uh, which is a Russian indigenous group. Galina is currently serving as the executive director of Cultural Survival, which is an indigenous led NGO and a US registered non profit advocating for the rights of indigenous people. So, Galina is uh, live today with us. So, Galina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, my name is Galina Angarova, and I'm an indigenous woman uh, from the Apsai clan of the Heret Nation of the Buryat people since Siberia. And I'm speaking today from the lands of the Ohlone people, which, are, uh, which is now known as the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm also the executive director of Cultural Survival. And we are a veteran indigenous rights, indigenous led organization with almost 50 years of experience working to protect indigenous people's rights and support indigenous people's self-determination, cultures and political resilience since 1972. We are a staff of 28 people, mostly women, mostly indigenous, working in nine countries around the world. We work through a holistic strategy and wrap around programming that's um, uh, through advocacy, capacity building, and grant making. 
Uh, thematically, we work through a rights-based approach centering indigenous community well-being on the nexus of climate change, land defense, food sovereignty, freedom of expression, and the leadership of indigenous women and youth as the protagonists to achieve our collective self-determined future. Indigenous women have long been marginalized and face multiple levels of discrimination. Imagine you are an indigenous woman living in a far away place in a remote area where um, access to electricity, education, and other necessity is are limited. And you're facing discrimination based on your gender, your ethnicity, due to remote location, sometimes disability. This has a compound impact on many indigenous peoples around the world. However, as indigenous women, we carry millennia old knowledge as guardians of our land, waters, and cultural and biological diversity. We are the original healers and holders of our cultural knowledge. It is the knowledge that has, be, has been passed down from one generation to the next that makes us indigenous women original storytellers, keepers of our tradition and oral history, and the best experts of our own landscapes. Climate change solutions must include the holistic worldviews and traditional knowledge of indigenous women if they are to be successful. To uplift indigenous women and youth globally, cultural survival and GEO indigenous lands have formed a new collaboration that combines traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples and earth observation technologies to strengthen indigenous peoples' climate change solutions and land defense. Bringing both organizations' strengths and networks, we will engage indigenous women and youth and their communities to uplift indigenous leadership and traditional knowledge, center equity and indigenous self-determination, and support, empower, and connect indigenous communities all over the world in their climate change and land defense solutions. With utilization of technologies and science, including geospatial data and GIS, as well as indigenous media, communications, advocacy, and human rights instruments. So stay tuned and support the work of cultural survival and GEO and the Genesis Alliance. Thank you. So thank you for your presentation. Uh, we actually now have a couple of minutes for uh, questions. So I encourage all participants to, po to post their questions in our chat. And uh, I will also use the opportunity to um, ask a question to you. So. Um, you mentioned uh, that uh, climate change solutions uh, have to be holistic and they have to combine indigenous knowledge uh, together with the uh, earth observation data. So can you maybe um, tell us a few examples or success stories um, about uh, combining this indigenous knowledge with uh, earth observation data like satellite images? Uh -huh. Our organization is still researching and embarking on this journey with the GEO Indigenous Alliance, uh, with specifically with Diana Mastrati. However, we've heard many examples that combine both traditional knowledge and um, um, new technologies. For example, in the north, some of the communities have come up with apps uh, monitoring the landscape, monitoring the sea ice, so that a lot of the hunters, traditional hunters, would know uh, how to deal with the changing environment on the dangerous sea ice when they go hunting. So we've, we've heard such technologies being developed. I think each place differs. Each place is very different. And each of the indigenous communities will have to come up with their own ways, of course, with free prior and informed consent, with their ways to, to um, um, monitor the changes of their landscapes because I think it's the combination of people and place that makes a difference. You know, people in indigenous cultures, people are inseparable from place and place are inseparable from people. And the combination of the two that makes a difference because as indigenous peoples, we carry the knowledge of that place. We're interconnected to that place. The landscape, the, the species, and the cultural and biological diversity is interconnected. So that's, 
makes indigenous peoples the best experts, the best guardians of that place. And I think that that knowledge and in the technology will immerse, emerge from that knowledge, not you know, vice versa. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and I think it's uh, time to move to our next speaker. Thank you. So um, our next speaker is uh, Diana Mastracci. Uh, she's the co-founder of the Jew Indigenous Alliance and also founder of Space for Innovation. And today she will be talking about the, the indigenous uh, hackathons. So Diana, the floor is yours. Okay, it might be that Jana is experiencing some uh, connection issues. Um, I would suggest we'll just uh, wait uh, one minute to see if uh, we can get her back. Um, otherwise, um, I will announce our next speaker. Okay, well, I think uh, Diana is experiencing some uh, connectivity issues, but uh, we are um, well on track, so uh, we can catch up uh, later with her presentation. And um, I think uh, I would suggest that we uh, go to our next speaker. So our next speaker is uh, Lucy Kaiser. Um, Lucy is a social scientist at GNS Science and the Joint Center of Disaster Research at Massey University in New Zealand. Uh, she's also a Bukenga, which is a research fellow of the EQC Maori Disaster Risk Redu Reduction Research Center. For her PhD, she's investigating how the Muihiku, uh, that's uh, Southern Tanganata Wenua view, and respond uh, to uh, the impacts of climate change. So um, Lucy is based in New Zealand, and there is a, a quite a, a huge uh, time lag um, uh, between us. So uh, actually we have a pre-recorded video from Lucy. Um, unfortunately, she's not uh, able to attend live uh, because of the time difference, but um, in her video she has uh, shared her email and uh, also if any of the attendees have uh, questions, um, I'll make sure to forward them to Lucy and uh, you get answer from her. Um, so um, I think now we can um, have a look at her uh, video. Tina Koto, ko Lucy Kaiser Tokuingua, ko Ngai Tahu, Kati Mamoi, me Waitaha Okuiwi. I'm a Māori disaster researcher at GNS Science and Massey University in Aotearoa, New Zealand. As the indigenous people of Aotearoa, New Zealand, Māori have experienced hundreds of years of natural hazards and disasters. Long before colonization, we scientifically observed and monitored environments around us for phenomena such as geothermal and seismic activity. Māori disaster risk reduction knowledge is passed from generation to generation through Mataranga Māori, including stories and songs of past events. Examples of this include Māori place names that reflect natural hazard risks. Hora Whenua, for example, translates to landslides, which gives a clear message to future generations about the land. Stories of Tanifa, Guardian spirits of the water in coastal areas have been linked to geological evidence of tsunami, and stories of Ruamoko, the personified ancestor of earthquakes, have been linked to periods of seismic unrest. In 2019, Aotearoa New Zealand's National Emergency Management Agency released a National Disaster Resilience Strategy. It sets out how important it is to build the relationship between emergency management organisations and iwi and groups representing Māori to ensure a greater understanding and integration of Māori perspectives and protocols in emergency management. 
It also makes clear that partnering with Māori and including Māori cultural values and protocols in disaster resilience is vital to developing a resilient New Zealand. Public funding is beginning to better support Māori-led research that addresses Māori priorities in the DRR space. Many grants now require applicants to demonstrate the relevance and benefit of the work to Māori, and increasingly the expectation from government is that projects should be by Māori, for Māori and with Māori across the science funding landscape. While these increases in Mataranga Māori funding opportunities show progress, there are still significant challenges for Māori researchers and for Māori communities wishing to equitably participate and lead DRR research. So with this in mind, I have a series of recommendations for achieving a more inclusive DRR space in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Iwi, hapu and marae need to be treated as partners with a legitimate voice in local, regional and national civil defence planning, policy and legislation. Practitioners, policymakers and researchers well versed in te ao Māori need to be employed to ensure policy is effectively implemented to enable best practice Māori-led DRR. Best practice DRR information should be co-created and shared between researchers, practitioners, policymakers and communities in a manner that respects Mataranga Māori. Māori perspectives need to be equitably incorporated into emergency management and disaster media narratives highlighting not only the response period, but the proactive work in the DRR space. Resourcing Māori for DRR activities needs to be proactively organised in advance of an event, and mitigation and preparedness work needs to be supported. And finally, rangatahi and the wider community need to be included in DRR practice and research. Nga mihi nui, thank you so much for listening. If you would like to follow up on anything I've presented today, please email me at this address. Ka kite. Yeah, so um, as I previously mentioned, um, uh, we don't have uh, Lucy right now with us, but um, you could uh, directly write her an email or you can post uh, your question for her in the chat and then I'll make sure to, to forward it to her. And uh, now I think I saw uh, Tiana among uh, the participants. So uh, Tiana, if you're here, just make a sign and uh, we can catch up with uh, your presentation. Yes, I'm here. So sorry, I had some internet issues. Yeah, no problem. I will share my presentation now. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yeah, we can see it. Um, so one of the core pathways of the Gender Genus Alliance is to increase the particip participation of indigenous youth in Earth observations. And today I will talk to you a little bit about the Indigenous Hackathons and the Indigenous Youth Awards. Um, so the focus of the Indigenous Hackathons is to empower Indigenous communities to access and utilize uh, Earth observation data and tools within a cultural context. Um, so the Indigenous Hackathons emerged from consultations with the Inupia community in the Alaskan Arctic who are interested to co-design um, tools with and for indigenous peoples. So we adapted the method of a traditional hackathon that are competitions to develop software incorporating the needs of the community. And we co-designed a new methodology called indigenous hackathons that at the core, um, it uh, enables uh, communities to increase their inter intergenerational knowledge transfer, as that's how knowledge is transferred in indigenous communities, uh, increase cross-cultural communication between the indigenous youth and scientists, and um, to maintain and strengthen the local culture. Uh, so how did it, does it work? Uh, the hackathons are divided into three phases. In the first phase, we run a pre-hack in which indigenous youth consult with their elders to come up with challenges that are locally relevant and that can be solved using Earth observation data. Once the challenges are ready, they become part of the final, final hack, which can take place both locally or uh, worldwide. And throughout the process, participants are mentored by experts in remote sensing, indigenous knowledge, technology development. And uh, after the um, 
we mentor the, the winning teams uh, to ensure that the winning solution is co-designed uh, with the community. So we had our first uh, hack in uh, 2014, uh, Arctic Science, which was a local hack based in Barrow in Alaska. And since then we've been having um, an indigenous hackathon every year. Um, the last one that we had was the Gen Indigenous Hack for COVID in uh, last year. Um, we, the hackathons usually attract, uh, besides working with ind indigenous communities, uh, attract all sorts of hackers from artists to scientists to programmers, as well as the um, members of the geo community. And for our last hack, we worked with uh, several indigenous leaders, uh, Mario Vargas Chacaim, uh, Titus Letapo, uh, James Redfinley Sr., uh, Leo Cerda, and Claudine de Sosa. And um, um, we had 146 participants from 33 countries. Uh, one of the winning teams was the SymbolSmack uh, team who are developing a new way for indigenous communities to map their territory using local symbols instead of geographic coordinates. The challenge was submitted by Titus Letapo and um, um, Titus has been engaged in a weekly co-design uh, workshops together with the uh, winning team to ensure that the app is uh, culturally relevant and it's uh, nearly finished. So we are all very excited about that. Um, the second winning team from last year's hackathon was the Visibly Data app. Um, that is a super easy to use visualization tool for any community uh, to share their story with the rest of the world. Um, the um, challenge was submitted by Claudina de Sousa from uh, the Brazilian Amazon. And they wanted this tool to be intuitive and interactive uh, with customizable base layers and uh, to be able to geotech pictures and sound and music um, to share uh, how COVID has been affecting their communities and to become uh, visible uh, at an international level. And uh, we are currently working with on the G Indigenous Youth Awards that we are um, still finalizing, but the, the core idea is to develop, to create a pool of really talented young indigenous leaders from around the world who are grounded in their cultural values and who will act as positive role models and provide them with uh, personal and academic support and inspire the next generation of indigenous youth. And to finish, I would like to um, um, end with this quote from Douglas Mbura, who was one of the winners of the hackathon from the Kisi tribe in Kenya and who, um, talks about how indigenous hackathon has made him realize how we are all related and we are all one. And, uh, and there is an urgent need to work together and co-design innovative solutions that are sustainable and culturally sensitive. Uh, so please do get in touch and um, we would love to uh, learn how we can collaborate with you. Thank you, that, that's my email address. Yeah, thank you, Diana. Um, I think we have, uh one minute uh, questions, uh, time for questions for you, and then we can start with the general discussion. So um, I will use the opportunity to, to ask you a question. So uh, you have uh, quite a lot of experience in organizing these hackathons. And um, you mentioned that that has been uh, basically a classical format that has been uh, used in other contexts. And then you use uh, this hackathon format um, uh, basically to uh, for, for the needs of uh, indigenous people. So what are some uh, challenges that you faced uh, in organizing these hackathons? Uh, thank you for the question, Nicolina. Uh, the main challenge uh, is uh, finding funding. Um, unfortunately, it's not very easy to uh, find uh, funding for such activities. Uh, the um, Another challenge that we face is uh, the time it takes. Uh, it takes time to build relationships with the indigenous communities. Um, and also finding, uh, we now have an established network of, uh, of mentors that you are a part of as well. Uh, and that is growing rapidly. Um, 
but uh, yes, always finding new people that uh, want to, to join and um, uh, share their knowledge and um, Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so actually, there was uh, one uh, question um, that I had uh, for Mario, um, but uh, maybe uh, we can uh, you can now uh, translate it uh, to, for him. Sure. Um, so um, basically, I mentioned in the beginning of the um, of our session um, that I'm also personally involved in this project, which is uh, led uh, by uh, Mario uh, about um, it's about this reforestation project that we have in the Amazon forest. Uh, so I was wondering if uh, Mario can uh, tell us a few more words about it. Sure. Uh, Mario, is this online? Um, Mario is online. Yeah. Mario, um, yeah. ¿nos puedes decir algo más sobre el proyecto Shakaim, por favor? Sí, buenos días a todos. Eh, desde la Amazonía, les expreso, les mando un abrazo fuerte a todos a cada uno de los que estamos en este día. Un poco quisiera exponer eh, sobre el proyecto Shakaim que tenemos eh, previsto ejecutar, pero sobre todo las actividades va encaminado a los conocimientos de nuestros pueblos en materia de nuestros territorios y también que nuestras comunidades aledañas, nuestras comunidades alejadas de la Amazonía puedan tener una conectividad y puedan comunicarse con el resto del mundo. No sé si está ahí puede ayudar mediana traducción. Uh, sí, claro. So he's sending a, a big hug to everyone from the Amazon and um, he wanted to discuss a little bit about the Shakarin project that is uh, based on the indigenous knowledge of the uh, Shuar people in the, uh, of the Amazon, and as well about the need to um, ensure that the communities who are uh, not connected to the internet have access to internet. Sí, Mario. Uh, entonces, eh, entonces, el proyecto Shakeim, como su nombre mismo dice, es a favor del cuidado de la naturaleza, a favor del cuidado de los mismos pueblos, a favor del cuidado de los conocimientos, sabidurías relacionados al, de los pueblos para el mundo. Porque actualmente nuestras comunidades desconocen muchas cosas lo que está sucediendo en tema de nuestros territorios. Muchas informaciones que la comunidad científica lo tiene, nosotros desconocemos. Con este proyecto queremos un poco visibilizar a los pueblos y también a la comunidad internacional. Uh, gracias, Mario. Um, so the, prog the project Shakaim, uh, the, the word Shakaim means to conserve and protect the environment in the Shuar language. And it's in, um, it's in favor of uh, protecting uh, indigenous knowledge, indigenous wisdom related to the um, sustainable use of uh, nature because their um, uh, scientific knowledge does not uh, reach the communities. Um, so he wants, uh, the project is aimed to um, um, in increase uh, scientific knowledge amongst the, the, the Shuar community and as well to exchange uh, indigenous knowledge with the rest of the world, with the scientific community. Sí, muchas gracias por la pregunta. Uh, he's uh, saying thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you, Mario. Thank you, Diana, for uh, translating. Um, Indeed, it's a very uh, interesting project. I'm, I'm really happy to be involved uh, with that. And um, yeah, I think uh, now we can proceed to more general discussion. So actually, we have uh, one uh, question in our chat. Uh, so I will just um, shortly read it. So, uh, uh, so the question is from uh, Michael Chavez. Um, how to activate the political will 
for the application of policies aimed at protecting the indigenous people's rights. There are many challenges. Um, so you can also view the uh, question in the chat section. And uh, I will uh, ask uh, our panelists to uh, maybe, uh, approach this question. And uh, Diana, if it will be possible again to, to translate the question, it will be really great. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Nicolina, is that question from me repeated, please? So basically, the question is um, how to activate the political will. So basically, what are the, the challenges that we face in the application of policies uh, that are aimed towards uh, protecting indigenous people, indigenous people and their rights? Like what, what are the challenges um, that uh, we face uh, in interacting with, uh, with politicians? That, uh, that is how I would rephrase the questions. Um, I don't know if um, our panelists have uh, uh, had some experience in uh, interacting with um, uh, politicians or just some uh, governmental bodies and um, what are the challenges that they face in, well, let's say in communication in communicating their needs with um, with the uh, government. Uh, Galina, would you like to answer that? Yeah, it's a complicated question, but let me uh, take a stab at that. Um, uh, I've been as as um, I have some experience working directly with some governments in my capacity as the uh, representative of the Indigenous Peoples Constituency to the UN to the Sustainable Development Agenda, uh, to a post 2015 Development Agenda and SDGs from 2013 to 16. I would say it's not easy, uh, and it's not going to take. Um, uh, <laughs> The, the changes don't happen overnight. Um, it's a long process. I think that since a few decades ago, as indigenous people, we have achieved quite a, um, uh, a lot uh, with the adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, ILO 169, uh, and um, there have been some in incredible cases legal cases uh, uh, around the world, but the pressures on indigenous peoples continue and indigenous lands and territories and resources continue. How do we activate the political will? I think that ad advocacy tools, um, communication tools, uh, organizing people on the ground, um, training people, providing capacity for indigenous peoples on the ground to advocate for their rights, uh, as prescribed in the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples are really key. Um, using, I, I also mentioned using the, um, the technologies uh, to advance their rights are also, I think it's, it's just another opportunity for us as Indigenous Peoples. Um, uh, just uh, solidarity. Um, we are what 460 million people around the world, about 62.2% of the total population. And uh, we manage 80% of the remaining biological diversity. Indigenous people's lands spend 24% of the total land surface around the world. And we manage 24% of the all carbon stored above ground in the world's tropical forest. Just these that show how important the indigenous peoples are to this planet. I think we are the only population in the world that stands between the, to the, uh, the total, before the total destruction of this planet, managing 80% of the remaining biological diversity. And that I think it's important to tell that story, to tell that story to, to the political leaders, to the corporate leaders, to understand that 
indigenous people play an, an incredible and important role on this planet. Yeah, um, um, yeah. thank you for um, sharing your experience in uh, dealing yeah. with, uh, with with the government and trying to basically tell this story and uh, basically um, move people or politicians or people in power to, to make some changes. Um, if someone uh, from the other panelists want to say something, now it's the time. Otherwise, I will uh, use the opportunity to um, ask another question. Um, so actually among us, uh, there are um, quite a few members, uh, founding members of um, the Indigenous uh, Alliance. It's a pretty new initiative, or maybe not that new from 2019, but uh, I would like to uh, hear uh, some of you um, saying uh, a little bit more about the uh, about the indigenous alliance um what are some success stories uh, what do you want to do in futures like some future plans uh what are some obstacles that you are facing so um Crichton, titus maybe um you you want to say something on the topic Or Diana, maybe you want to uh, say a few words as well? Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Nicolina. And unfortunately, Titus uh, had to leave to another meeting. Um, so I think I will just share with you the uh, lessons learned from the Indigenous Summit that uh, uh, we had last uh, year in December, and which brought together Indigenous communities from around the world. And um, um, there were follow. There were uh, recommendations, uh, next steps that emerged from from this summit, which uh, complement the the pathways that of the Indigenous Alliance, and um, these are to promote Earth observation data and tools that enhance intergenerational knowledge uh, and transfer of knowledge, uh, advocate for Earth observation technologies that enhance Indigenous ecological practices and stewardship of Indigenous cultural heritage encourage the geo community to co-design geo tools in partnership with indigenous people, integrating their language, uh, their knowledge systems and their cultural values, uh, increase the number of indigenous students uh, who participate in experiential learning, uh, research and scholarship opportunities, uh, advocate for the use of the care principles for indigenous data governance, uh, raise the visibility and the role of indigenous knowledge for disaster risk reduction and climate action, and support empowerment of indigenous women and youth through earth observation data tools and uh, services. And um, as Mario mentioned as well, advocate for digital inclusion. And um, we will not be able to achieve these goals without partner, partnering, partnering sorry, with the geo community. Um, so, um, we, we really look forward to um, continuing um, um, to work with the geo community and to establishing uh, long lasting relationships. Uh, thank you, Nicolina. Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, actually I'm afraid our time for questions is uh, basically to its end. So um, I would like to um, basically uh, move forward with uh, our wrap up. Um, uh, uh, talks. So I would like to introduce first uh, Youssef Nasef, um, who will be uh, giving uh, closing remarks. Uh, so uh, Youssef is the director of the adaptation division at the UNFCCC. Uh, he has over 30 years of experience in diplomacy and international environmental policy. And uh, he's also a seconded uh, a diplomat from the Egyptian Foreign Service. So Yusef, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And, and thanks to Diana for, um, for, for inviting me here and uh, for this um, amazing group of speakers today who, who've really inspired me. And let me start with the last thing I heard from Galina and that the indigenous people stand between the current state of the world and total destruction. Um, and, and with this, um, uh, starting to look at the different things we heard here, all the way from uh, um, dealing with disaster risk reduction, 
uh, emergency management, data sovereignty, sovereignty, and transferring knowledge uh, across generations, across uh, indigenous peoples uh, worldwide, gender issues. And into mind comes the notion of how do we approach all of what we heard towards a transformational um, mindset. And from the climate change perspective that, that I um, operate in, we've been told that we have just a few years in order to transform the world to a different paradigm or else we're doomed. The same came from the biodiversity perspective. You might know that there was a biodiversity assessment report as well in 2019 that basically gave us a few years of transformation. And so I, I feel um, that there are four uh, separate shifts in thinking that one might want to approach in order to ensure that indigenous practice, indigenous values, indigenous wisdom and worldview can actually guide the world towards that better place to which we aspire, rather than um, limiting the, the discourse on how can we um, support the indigenous peoples as a vulnerable group, also seeing the indigenous peoples as the guiding light for us to move into the future. And we heard that the indigenous communities are stewards of the remaining 80% of biodiversity which means that the rest of, of, of humanity was responsible for bringing their share down to 20%, and obviously that's not sustainable. So, so the first uh, shift in thinking um, that, uh, that I wanted to bring up is the whole change of mindset of the rest of the world towards these uh, amazing values of collectivism, connectivity, of intergenerational equity and uh, what Diana said at, at the end of her presentation on the hackathon, that we are all related and we are all one. Moving away from that uh, socioeconomic paradigm of extractivism to one of regeneration. And that requires a lot of, um, of support to the rest of the world to understand the value of, um, of these types of, of worldviews. And we are trying hard uh, within the UNFCC process. We have a uh, an indigenous peoples and local communities platform where the idea here is to make sure that the rest of the United Nations uh, climate change negotiations benefit from this worldview in moving ahead rather than restricting the discourse to national uh, um, interests and trying to avoid economic hardship etc but actually to move the world towards that type of mindset. Number two, shifting from a short-term view to a long-term view. I mean, we're talking about Earth observations, we're talking about the technology as it exists today, but also realizing the paradigm shift that's happening within the next few years. I mean, some of the stuff in the pipeline looks like science fiction, and it's moving us into a world where this frontier technology can be a tool, it can be a tool um, that can be used for, um, for good or for bad. So guiding uh, these tools including aspects of, um, of, uh, of data governance and coverage and new inequities that com might come into place, um, guiding that evolution of technology towards a place that can amplify the benefits that come out of, um, of indigenous people's practices and knowledge would be something we would want to uh, focus on. Now, in this context, the whole notion of science being um, what happens in universities or peer reviewed publications and everything outside that gets treated in a different way. This is also something that I think is part of the shift in thinking that we will be pushing and need to push where a lot of the wisdom, a lot of the, the on the ground real science comes from traditional communities and traditional observations and, uh, and knowledge. And this, we still need to make that um, transition. Um, and, and with all this, the, the whole bridging of um, the traditional with new technologies is not really sufficient, but redefining learning, redefining uh, scientific education to make sure that we bring on board um, the indigenous peoples is something that will uh, necessarily become part of our discourse as we move forward. Now, some of you might have heard of the Resilience Frontiers Initiative we're doing in UNFCC, where, which has eight pathways to that transformation. And the first pathway is about transforming humanity's relationship with nature, building on indigenous values. So this is now a core um, area of discourse in, in our process as well. And I think that as we, as we try to amplify this, um, this message, it will indeed uh, serve very positively in, in the discourse from the international community. 
And finally, just to know that we are at a crossroads today. One is what I mentioned on the technological uh, paradigm shift and the massive advances happening in satellite technologies, in AI, in Internet of Things, in drones, in 3D printing, in biotechnology and mimicry, et cetera, uh, on the one hand. And on the second uh, uh, level, there is now a, a very pronounced enhanced recognition in the international system of uh, indigenous rights, knowledge, practices, values, wisdom, um, and it is increasing, at least from the climate change perspective, we're seeing it uh, uh, proceed very strongly, and we're doing the best that we can in advancing it. Diana, I, I'm very happy with, with your idea of the hackathons. We'd be very happy to support it as well. You said you have um, limitations of funding, and if there are any other activities going on that can contribute to furthering this notion, allowing the rest of the world to modernize towards indigenous values, in order to save humanity for extinction, from extinction, we would be very happy to support that. With this, I stop and thank you very much once again. Thank you, Yusef, for your uh, nice words. And I think it's also great that uh, we can uh, now discuss as a group and um, people who are um, uh, working uh, directly in and with uh, indigenous uh, communities uh, can share their uh, obstacles and challenges, and then we can uh, find uh, mutual, uh, mutual uh, solutions. That's really great. Um, just uh, before we continue with uh, our uh, next um, closing talk, uh, there is uh, one question that I missed. Uh, the question is um, for uh, Lillian, and I think now she's uh, online. So I will just shortly read the question. Um, so um, Lillian, um, do you have access to satellite images? And um, basically what would be the benefit um, for um, using um, both observation data or satellite images uh, for your uh, work um, with uh, women? Okay, thank you. Yeah, we don't have the satellites, the first thing. Uh, the second, we don't also have the electricity and you know, uh, power is everything. If you, if you have the satellite, you can be able to share our data. We can be able to access uh, the movement of animals, uh, the health centers. So actually we don't have that data. We don't have that satellite. We don't have the power. Uh, it, it's very crucial and it's very important for a very, a very human being to have knowledge and to have information because information is power. So for us, we don't have uh, the, the satellite and the data is very crucial for indigenous women, especially those who are also conserving the environment. They can able to map out their, 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 their location. They can be able also to share their mapping in terms of educating others. Yeah, for, so for us, no. So that's our main challenge. Yeah, um, thank you for uh, sharing your insights. And I think now it's time to move to our uh, next uh, speaker, I'm which is... Sorry. Uh, sorry, and I'm very sorry that I was kicked out because my, ne my network was very poor. So I didn't even see the video uh, that you played, but it's okay, thank you. Oh yeah, well, uh, no problem. I think, um, as you mentioned, uh, technical obstacles um, are basically one of the challenges uh, that the indigenous communities are facing. So. That was uh, just an example of this, um, but thank you for uh, joining later and answering questions. Thank you again. Um, so um, our next speaker is uh, Einar Bjorgo. Uh, Einar is a, a director of the Division for Satellite Analysis and Applied Research at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. In that capacity, he uh, oversees the Operational Satellite Applications Program, UNOSAT, and uh, strategic implementation of the 2030 Agenda Unit. So, Einar, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to thank uh, all the participants here for sharing their knowledge. I really learned a lot by listening in today. Uh, and one of the things that um, uh, I realized uh, and was very interesting is, you know, that there are so many challenges that are similar for the various uh, indigenous communities. So I think you know, for, we need to find a way to basically collect these challenges and be quite systematic about it. 
because then it will be so much easier to support the communities with data because the data, the information exists. And we need now, and that has been a big failure, I, was, I think, of the whole remote sensing community up till now, is that it's been collecting data, but nothing has been shared, nothing has been, nothing, very little has been put into action, uh, especially towards indigenous societies and communities. So we need to learn from you, what do you need and how can we help you? Because without that um, structured approach to it, then it's, it's, you know, it's a little pilot here, it's a little pilot there. And what I'm really interested in is to really make a big impact using this technology. And for that, we need your input. And I think that the GEO initiatives here is absolutely crucial in that regards. So from my side, um, when we look at, for example, remote sensing satellite imagery, um, as UNITAR, we are here. We're here to support the countries. We're here to support communities and um, making sure that uh, the information is being used and it's served in a format that is usable. So also in that regards, I think it's extremely important that we are able to have this, this dialogue. And again, um, uh, I learned a lot from, from the discussions here today, but I think that we need to have much, much closer, closer interact, interaction moving forward. We need much more focus on this. And um, I would really love to see how we can much better serve you. So in that sense, it's about one thing, it's about access to data. Another thing is about access to, to the technology. Another challenge as well, of course, is language, right? In, in especially towards indigenous societies. But we have many good, um, uh, I would say, ambassadors here that I'm sure will do their very best to, to, to help us um, spread the world, the, the word in, in, in the right language. Uh, and I think also from, from our side, if we are able to, to really focus on something practical, we don't have to, uh, to necessarily solve all the problems at once, but I think there are so many uh, low hanging fruits here that we can do. Uh, simply giving you access to, to imagery. Uh, and again, it's not really about the imagery, it's about the information from the imagery. So if we can do that and then serve it to you, and, the, it, uh, and again, the information exists. So, uh, so we do need to see how can we much better help you? So please, let's, let's move forward with an action-oriented approach so that we can better serve you. Um, we have, as was just mentioned, not much time. So the sooner we can do this, the better it is. And I think it would be great if, if GEO and or other uh, actors could together define um, what is sort of the most crucial information that indigenous uh, communities would need so that we can serve this information. Uh, you know, is it uh, deforestation coverage? Is it um, uh, coastal uh, erosion? Uh, whatever it is, uh, it is, it is uh, important to convey this information. Uh, we have a, a project, a climate change project in the Pacific. And when I go to the, um, to the communities and we discuss with them, I was fortunate enough to be taken around and, and listening to the elders. And um, just by doing that, you know, it, it totally changes your perspective, of course, from our side, because we, we, we are not used to that. We are not a part of that community. But if we are able to, to get that information, whatever they, they need, and uh, we can easily find solutions for them, then that is something that is, is really important. So I think you know, um, it, it's, it's good to, to keep meeting, but let's get down into the action of things and let's do that together. And let's see what would be you know, five low hanging fruits, five types of data, and I understand that each the different communities have maybe different needs, but I do think that much of the information can still be, be very easily made accessible to you. A little bit of training and with, a, with your fantastic local knowledge, then I think we can put this technology and merge the technology with the indigenous knowledge and we can have a good success story. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, I think um, without uh, delaying it any further, uh, we have to move to our uh, next speaker and uh, also last speaker for uh, our today's session. So uh, this is uh, Gilberto Camara. Gilberto is the director of the Geo Secretariat since July 2018. 
He's uh, well known in the geo community as a leading researcher in geoinformatics, geographical information science, and plant use change. And he has been recognized internationally for promoting free access and open source software for uh, Earth observation data. Gilberto, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So my uh, words uh, are of the, on behalf of the whole geo secretariat of enormous thanks for the organizers of this session, which uh, continues on the, the support we have and the great work we had, which was in the Geo Indigenous uh, Conference and workshop that we had in the end of 2020. So what we would like uh, from the Geo Secretary to say that we are delighted, we are absolutely pleased that you have uh, decided and made us uh, the honor of supporting you. Uh, I will not uh, belabor, Galina has stated much better than I would do. Uh, the indigenous communities all over the world are the, the keepers of the land. They are uh, the crucial uh, guardians of what is left on biodiversity and our protection of the land in times of global change. I think that is not news it has always been that way. What is more news, and I think that's, I think a little bit positive here, is the recognition by people who up to certain points were like keeping the indigenous community at arm's length. So the recognition that GEO, for example, would not be complete if it not, would not offer a forum and support for indigenous community. I don't think this is, for me, it's absolutely obvious. I'm not sure it was obvious 10, 15 years ago. And uh, now it's becoming more even obvious the following points to follow up that uh, GEO cannot empower you. You have to empower yourselves. In other words, what, you, what GEO can do is tell you what is available tell you where the goods are, but the end use, the way to use that is back to you. If we can help your empowerment, your capacity to protect the environment, to recognize your role, to recognize your leadership, this is an honor for us. And I think that's the opportunity that we have in our hands. And I think I would like to thank you very much for giving us this opportunity, for giving us the land. As some of you may know, I'm Brazilian and I've been involved in protecting the Amazon and uh, been involved with people who have, uh, let's say, strong connections with indigenous communities. And now my country is facing a terrible, and I cannot put terrible, I mean, it, it's, it's basically, sort of nothing short of a catastrophe in the recognition of uh, indigenous rights. And of course, Earth observation has been and will be of some help in that. Of course, we cannot solve all the problems, but a lot of the evidence that is on the misuse and the, the criminal activities that have been taken over the indigenous lands in Brazil is provided by Earth's observation. And uh, we, recognizing that is the case, recognizing that Earth's observation has a place to support you. I would like again to congratulate all of you and to really state that GEO will be at your side. We will be at the side of respecting the principles, respecting your independence, respecting your capacity and your uh, Time honored means of protecting our environment. So I'm delighted, honored to be part of this session. Thank you very, very much. And may you continue your important work. We need it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gilberto, for your uh, sincere and encouraging words. Um, so at the end of our session, that's is a little bit longer than planned. So uh, thanks again for uh, staying to the end with us. Um, I would also like to um, say a few words. 
So um, I think what was uh, common across all uh, presentations was that um, um, it was visible that indigenous people really feel that personal responsibility uh, for the land um, that they have. And um, uh, this responsibility is very strong and they're uh, willing to, to act. And uh, also they are willing to, to share their knowledge uh, both with uh, with the scientific community and also with other indigenous communities across the world. And uh, for example, as uh, Titus said, there are some obstacles in sharing their knowledge. For example, funding is uh, one of the reasons or also right now traveling. Of course, it's much easier to, um, to interact and communicate when you can talk to people face to face. And uh, yeah, it can be um, yeah, also expensive exercise sharing that knowledge. Um, but yeah, well, also what um, Galina mentioned at the end, um, yeah, indigenous communities do share some challenges, but at the end, each situation, uh, each community is unique because of its people and because of the place of the land it has. And um, yeah, so uh, what uh, Einar also uh, mentioned, um, we have to try to somehow uh, get an overview of those uh, challenges that are basically um, similar across communities and uh, try to um, approach it and to have some bigger impact. So I uh, try to basically formulate what are the main challenges uh, and uh, be basically very um, um, like proactive and just, okay, these are the, the requirements that the communities have what are the particular data sets that we can offer to them to uh, basically enable the communities to face those challenges? And as Gilberto said, at the end, um, yeah, at the end, it's in the in the hands of the communities themselves to uh, basically use the data, and uh, the scientific community can only uh, support them. And. Um, yeah, also what uh, Yusef said um, is also important that we need a change of the mindset, also how we communicate science, because the way we do it now in peer-reviewed journals uh, do not, or basically rarely includes um, indigenous knowledge. And uh, basically we have to uh, rethink um, the way we communicate that and uh, also shift our focus from short term to rather long term, because if we really want to make some big impact, um, we have to think long term. And um, yeah, I think we also, um, of course, uh, our presenters didn't have a lot of time, but uh, they also mentioned some uh, very um, detailed um, obstacles and challenges that are facing in accessing uh, satellite uh, data like uh, technical obstacles, um, a lack of um, electricity. Um, also, as Aina mentioned, uh, language can also be an issue sometimes. And uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, as already mentioned, it's important to, to meet and to discuss, but then also to, to take some uh, concrete um, actions. So um, thanks again for everyone uh, attending and um, I hope to see you soon on other events. Thank you.